Polly, dear. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Joan. Have a nice weekend. <laughs> machines in the office, the computer is probably the most awe-inspiring. But despite all the hype and jargon surrounding them, they've now become so easy to use that they're on almost every office desk. This change would never have happened without word processing. For most people, word processing is actually their only use for a computer. It is an extraordinarily elaborate way to write something with a separate keyboard, monitor, computer and printer, but uh, the ease of trying sentences out and moving them about does give writing a whole new freedom. In this program, Rex and I are going to look at the evolution of the word processor and at least try to demystify some of the jargon surrounding it. The word processor came from combining the computer with a much earlier invention, the typewriter. This is part of the Science Museum's enormous collection of typewriters. The first attempts were unbelievably clumsy. This is the appropriately named Pratt Teratype of 1860. The paper goes on here, that's the maximum size on this plate. And when you press one of the piano keys, the type pops up here. It's unbelievably tiny. This is uh, an early typewriter made by Charles Wheatstone. This one looks a bit like an old primer stove. It actually still works quite well. With this one, you put the paper in this uh, brass frame with a bit of carbon over it. And then you put the writing ball down on top of it and you punch in the letters, or well, they're supposed to spring back out again. Press the keys while the, while the um, frame moves under it. And uh, this one's a sort of early version of a golf ball. But uh, this machine, um, the Scholes and Glidden from 1875, revolutionised the typewriter. This was the first one that could type faster than you could write by hand. It was the first machine to be mass-produced and the first machine to have the QWERTY layout of the keys that's been used ever since. His machine appeared just at the time that offices were expanding rapidly. By 1900, typewriters had become an established part of any office, introducing a whole new workforce of women. Miss Smith, what can you tell us about your Model B? Right now, I wouldn't trade my typewriter for the world. The new improvements to typewriter ribbons and the new proportional spacing of my Model B, our business letters appear so elegant. And I've even increased my typing speed, too. One thing, though. I wish they'd invent a typewriter that could erase or eliminate errors. I'd never have to stop to erase again. Well, maybe someday. Word processors remove this problem because before everything's finally committed to paper, it's stored in a form that's easy to modify and manipulate in electrical circuits. If you're opening a machine up, it gives no obvious clue how it does this. It just reveals a maze of intricate circuits and a collection of inscrutable silicon chips. Tiny even more complicated mazes of minute circuits. It's sort of worlds within worlds. However, all these tiny circuits are really just vast collections of transistors, just like this. And all each transistor does, if I just put it in this holder here, is to switch the electric current on and off. 
In theory, an entire computer could be made from enough transistor circuits like this. This computer board's all still connected up, and if I pause it for a minute, at any instant, every single transistor in the chip is either fully on or fully off. Everything that's fed into the computer has to be converted to a form that can be handled by the on-off language of the chips. Word processing uses a code called ASCII. The letters of the alphabet are converted to seven bits that can each be on or off. So if I type a letter A, that's on, off, 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 on, on. B is a different one. C, D, E. Each letter of the alphabet lights a different combination. And capital letters turn this bit off. The idea of coding things in a digital way like this started long before the age of computers. Have your tickets ready. All tickets, please. Well, howdy, ma'am. May I see your ticket? Uh, sure. <laughs> These tickets, called punch photographs, had lists which were punched out when the ticket was bought. All seems to match in here. Each space on the ticket could be punched or not punched, a primitive digital code. I like what I see. Oh. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> well, why, thank you. Hey, you suspicious-looking character. Give me your ticket. Sure. What? The punch photograph was a futile attempt to deter train robbers. This don't match up. We have a robber on the train. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, everyone, don't panic. Don't panic. Just, just, just get out of here. <laughs> this is my lucky day. An inventor called Herman Hollerith adapted the cards to record numbers and letters of the alphabet for the US census count of 1890. Hollerith's machines became widely adopted in offices. The holes in the card form digital codes similar to the ASCII codes in a computer. However, Hollerith machines could only sort and count things. The unique advantage of a computer is that it can perform an infinite variety of processes. Instead of the fixed mechanisms in the Hollerith machines, computer circuits can be given infinitely variable coded instructions, the computer program. Computer programs are also written in codes of on-off bits. While the computer's working, both the program and the data, the letters you type, are stored inside chips called the computer's RAM, or random access memory. A chip like this can store 64,000 bits. But every time you switch the computer off, all the bits inside here are lost. So uh, to save things more permanently, they're recorded on magnetic disks. The coating of these disks is just the same as uh, audio or videotape. And the codes are recorded as minute bits of magnetism. With a solution of iron powder, you can actually see the magnetised parts of the disk. Each of these tracks can actually hold 72,000 on-off bits. Hard disks are the same idea, but they can store literally thousands of millions of bits. They're so sensitive they have to be sealed up inside the computer. And these heads, which record and play back the information, are so close to the disk that they do occasionally collide with it. And that's the origin of the computer crash. Terry's gerbil has got to go. If I could only find that memo about... Although the contents of the RAM and the disks are referred to as the computer's memory, it should really be called storage. Maybe Brenda remembers. Brenda, when was that memo sent round about pets in the office? The computer simply stores everything, whether it's useful or not. The clever part of human memory is really the forgetting bit. Our brains are constantly selecting what's worth remembering. Oh, no, wait! Wasn't it the same day I met Bruce, the fire officer? He was a pet and no mistake, yes! There it is! Splendid. Thank you, Brenda. The world's fastest mechanical brain. Misleading descriptions of computers stem from the 1950s 
when they were often referred to as giant brains. This indicator acts as the main control. Tape is fed in, tape that contains great masses of numerical data. The machine follows many of the patterns of man's own mind. Only the machine never goes in for daydreaming. In reality, these early computers were extraordinarily clumsy. This is a 1958 Pegasus, recently restored by the Computer Conservation Society. Instead of chips, it all works with valves. 1,800 of them, and they're all mounted on packages. And here's an example of a package from Pegasus. Three valves, old components. And uh, so it's like a sort of primitive printed circuit. Yes, this is an early form of printed circuit. To keep the valves cool, large amounts of air have to be blown through the computer, so it all has to be aerodynamically shaped, like a wind tunnel. And what we have to do, first of all, is to switch the HT on, and we press the HT button here, and that brings up the lines on the cathode ray tube here. And now we have to enter the instructions to start the engineer's test program. This is looking at the internal registers in the machine, and each of those little spikes there is an on-off bit within one register. So down is on, and up is off, and up is on. Is That's right? right, yes. Of course, you can also hear the um, engineer's test program playing on the loudspeaker down here. And having got a loudspeaker, there was an incentive for people to write tunes for the computer. And I can now load a tunes program in, and we have to load this on a paper tape reader oh, yeah. here. Yeah. And here's a tunes program punched on paper tape. And this we can load into Pegasus. And here we have the punched paper tape. So the holes are just like the holes in Hollerith punch cards. That's that right, yes, idea. yes. And we load that into the reader here. And then uh, we start the program running. And that's now loading the paper tape in. Now we load the music program. And now we can start the tunes program running. And now you can see the bit patterns there on the screen. Of the individual notes. Yeah. Writing programs on paper tape like this was very difficult. You didn't actually have to punch every individual hole. Instead, you used modified teletape machines like this. Each letter I press punches out a different combination of holes. Even so, it remains a, a very frustrating business because just one wrong key, and when the tape's transferred to the computer, the program won't run. Uh, as part of my engineering degree, I did a short computer course writing programs like this in 1970, and I don't remember ever getting a single program to run. The solution was to add a TV screen to the computer. This is one of the first computers to have one built in. It was introduced in 1969. Then, with uh, a special program called a line editor, if you put, ran this through the machine first, you could then write your own program, see what you were doing, and make adjustments and try it out as you went along. These line editor programs were really the forerunner of the modern word processor programs. I suppose that some of you are wondering what that television screen device is and what it has to do with the office of today. That equipment is called the IBM 3277 display terminal. Through its keyboard, characters are typed and displayed on the screen. Should the operator make an error, the backspace key works just like an eraser on a pencil, and the error disappears. Displaying everything like this needed a lot of circuitry. What made it practical was to miniaturize it all, combining the transistors into the first integrated circuits, or silicon chips. At first, these were relatively simple. This is an example. If I put one light in the output and two in the inputs, I can show you what it does. This is a comparing circuit. It switches the output on whenever the two inputs are the same as each other, either both off or both on. It switches the output off when only one input is lit. Even the simple comparing circuit can start to seem clever if it's working fast enough. 
that I can put in one set of inputs the ASCII code for a letter A and compare it with the other set. The output will only switch on if the other set is another A. If I were to do this enough times, I could compare whole words. And this is the basis of sophisticated word processor spell checkers, comparing words that you've typed in with words that are stored in the computer's memory. This clock I made works entirely with these simple sorts of chips. You tell the time, the hours by the number of balls here and the minutes by the amount of sand that's come through the hourglass. The chips are inside the high priest's casket. It's his sort of box of mysteries. I usually decorate my circuits with tiny people. I like the idea of this sort of secret world which they're all keeping going. I use this clip-on meter to see what's actually going on inside the chips. That one's counting the seconds. Uh, this one's sort of storing various holding circuits, storing the current time. Well, although I've had quite a lot of trouble keeping the, um, getting the mechanisms to work reliably, none of the chips have ever gone wrong. It's the extraordinary reliability of chips that's made it possible to build them more and more complicated. The modern microprocessor chip is almost a complete computer in itself. It controls all the other chips inside the computer. But although it's very complex, it's still built up of thousands of transistor switching circuits, and uh, it works by doing a lot of very simple things extremely quickly. Uh, we've uh, soldered a whole lot of lights onto this microprocessor and uh, insert this one. Oops. Switch the computer on. I've now rigged this one up so that I can slow it down and you can now actually see the bits of code moving around inside. These are either the coded letters or the instructions of what to do with them. Of course, in reality, this is actually switching at millions of times a second. Word processors could have remained highly expensive rarities, except for the dedicated hobbyists who started devising and selling personal computer kits made from microprocessor chips. The By the early 80s, companies like Sinclair and Amstrad had started to sell ready-built personal computers. Many came complete with their own word processor programs. ...and inclusive word processing software. It's more than a word processor, for less than most typewriters. The last part of the word processor to be perfected was the printer. The first sort to appear were dot matrix printers. These have a memory which stores the shape of each letter in patterns of ons and offs. Then inside the machine there's a device like this. The ons and offs are used to power a group of electromagnets which push out a tiny row of steel pins. It's funny really though to have all this high-tech equipment to produce something that looks considerably worse than ordinary typing. The next sort of printer to be developed was the daisy wheel. This has uh, a plastic wheel with the actual type on, a bit like a typewriter. This is fixed to an electric motor that rotates the wheel uh, with a sensor on the back to stop it in precisely the right place. And then there's simply a hammer, which is fixed to an electromagnet, to hammer the type onto the page. Oh. Seen this one, Miss M? You must be joking. You call this scrawl a job application? <sighs> I won't be interviewing him either. We'll have to re-advertise. Coffee break, I think. Hmm. Mm. All right. The daisy wheel was a marketing breakthrough. For the first time, anybody could write a professional-looking letter. Come in and try one. Yeah, I might. I could go for that. Oh, 
wicked. This man looks very good. Don't mm. you love the name? Mm, mm, <laughs> we'll see him. Mm, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord. You! <laughs> You're constantly oh, oh, scared of oh, 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 Wasting our oh, time. How dare oh, you? Oh, outrageous. The success of the daisy wheel led to the development of much faster and quieter printers. These have returned to the idea of creating the letters out of patterns of dots, like the pin matrix printers. Some are laser printers, which are quite complicated, but others simply squirt blobs of ink. Although our homemade version is a bit crude, Inkjet printers can actually squirt very tiny drops of ink with great accuracy. This is an actual print head. The computer powers tiny electric heating elements which create bubbles and force ink out through these tiny holes. The drops are so small they can form almost any style of type. But although computers are getting more and more sophisticated, the reality is usually rather less glamorous. If you'd like to come this way, sir. This is Miss Mathias, our head of department. Hello, I'm Osbert Greed from head office, here to ascertain whether your good self and subordinates are fully cognizant with every aspect of computer usage. I, I think I follow you. Of course, we all find our PCs absolutely, um... Kindly demonstrate. Oh, uh, yes, uh, well, I'll network everyone in, in the department to confirm current status. Oh, Mr Jones, Ooh. put the manuals away. Joan, don't use that old thing. Sorry. Pretend you understand the new one. Oh, no, Brian's got his shoes off. And where's his computer? Brian, get it out! Mm. I mean your computer. Mm. You should be writing letters by hand. Oh, Polly, you're being networked. You must confirm your current status. But I'm so bored. <laughs> Terry, you'll get us all into trouble. We're being inspected to see if we're computer literate. Hmm. The conclusions of my investigations will be issued subsequently in triplicate to this department. The new computer users are completely helpless if something goes wrong. Everyone has stories of floppy disks introducing rogue instructions or viruses. <laughs> In reality, catastrophic events are rare. Much of the most common problems are loose connections or coffee in the keyboard. The sheer complexity of the software, though, does lead to idiosyncrasies. Mine has a habit of occasionally freezing up so that uh, whatever I type, how, how, whatever keys I type, none of them do anything. The only way to sort it out is to switch the computer off and then switch it on again and then I lose everything that I've typed in the last few minutes. Personally, I find this reassuring. It reminds me that my word processor is just a useful gadget full of transistor switches, not some superhuman intelligence. Secret Life of the Word Processor in 1991. Um, 
I'd only just bought my first uh, personal computer at the time. Uh, there was an enormous amount of hype about them, um, but generally people didn't quite know what to do with them. And I suppose word processing was really the first uh, practical uh, function for most people. Uh, so at the time it was, it was unusual uh, to approach the subject from the application from word processor as a word processor rather than as a mathematical computing machine. Um, but uh, I'm pleased we did. <laughs> I think it worked out uh, better that way. Um, not least because uh, computers are complicated and uh, it's a large subject to try and uh, cover everything. Uh, I mean I dipped my toe in the water earlier in the 80s. Uh, I bought a a computer called a Kim One, uh, which is still uh, up on my board. Oh, it's just out of shot. Hang on, I'll just go and... Um, <clears throat> uh, where is it? There it is. I really struggled to get it to do anything at all. Um, I don't know. I was probably too impatient or something. So, um, instead, I bought a children's kit, a kid's kit, called Adventures in Microelectronics. And uh, this was basically about CMOS individual um, chips, uh, simple logic uh, circuits, um, and gates and flip flops and that sort of thing. Uh, so that um, medieval clock that's in the film, um, that was really me learning about these CMOS chips. Uh, I got them to do all the counting and uh, the outputs to the different motors uh, of the clock. Um, it was a good way uh, to learn about them. Um, so that was my introduction to the world of digital electronics and logic, if you like. Filming the Pegasus computer was brilliant. Um, the noise it made, all the air rushing through it, um, it aerodynamically styled, looked so beautiful too. Uh, the man, Tony Sale, who showed me round, was a complete genius, uh, who went on to restore an Enigma machine and set up the Bletchley, Bletchley Park Museum. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, he was working with the Computer Preservation Society, and it was a sort of race against time. Um, they had lots of really old um, engineers who'd, uh, uh, who were in their 90s, but who had actually uh, programmed uh, the Pegasus in the 50s and early 60s um, and they were trying to sort of um, make a, a simulated version so that when the valves finally failed the people would still be able to uh, program in the same sort of uh, language using uh, these old engineers expertise I was amazed by the large scale of all the chips and, the, <laughs> and either we even managed to solder to that uh, microprocessor, I think it was an old Commodore computer, that that would work at all. Um, things weren't as complicated as, as they are now. So these early computers, they just had one timing signal, lots and lots, and lots of complicated ones. Well, computers have changed enormously in many ways, uh, mainly getting smaller and more powerful. Um, we don't talk about them as giant brains anymore, now we talk about artificial intelligence. Um, I prefer to call artificial intelligence machine learning, um, as I think that's more accurate. Uh, and particularly as I've lived through decades of people talking about artificial intelligence, um, sort of rule-based things that didn't really get anywhere. Um, and although it's impressive what uh, these uh, the programs can do, um, so in fact these uh, new versions of Secret Life of Machines uh, are remastered with machine learning software. Um, so that was fascinating. I, I like to keep up with all this stuff, but uh, I think to me uh, computers remain a tool and uh, a tool for making things, um, uh, for designing things, uh, for working with video and for working with uh, images. Um, 
So the sort of more recent advances of things like social media uh, are probably too antisocial to uh, make much use of them. Um, <clears throat> finally, I couldn't resist um, including this in this uh, <laughs> commentary. Um, this is a, a, a wafer um, with lots and lots of um, silicon chips uh, on it. This is how they're made. Um, this this uh, was given, I got this, for the Science Museum from Intel um, for a new gallery they were doing about uh, materials in the, the late 90s. Um, and last year, though, they decided to take the gallery to bits and uh, offered me uh, the wafer back. But not only the wafer. I also, from Intel, managed to get the end of the silicon ingot. So this is a very, very pure uh, silicon. And it, it, they make it in a sort of long cylinder um, and they cut uh, the wafers with a very accurate uh, bandsaw before doping it and doing all the processes to add the chips. Anyway, <laughs> one of my favourite objects. <laughs>